God. Thank you, Brother Killingsworth. You may be seated. It's good to be here again this morning in Mississippi. Thank God I see that some of you survived the onslaught yesterday, so we'll have to turn up the heat a little bit this morning. You made it through yesterday. Now, I so greatly admire men that can present something in such a smooth and suave manner. Uh, There are men that can take the Word of God like a surgeon takes a scalpel. And uh, they'll give you a little Holy Ghost anesthesia and take that scalpel of the Word of God and remove that malignancy from you so tenderly and easily that you don't even know that you've been operated on. Praise God. But uh, uh, I especially admire your good superintendent, Brother Travis. Now, he preaches hard and straight, but he does it in such a, a way that it leaves you smiling. And uh, you, you just think, well, that's the way it ought to be. And, well, I, I wish I could be like that. I, uh, I've tried. I, but uh, I, I'm more like a bulldozer. I, I just crack up my motor and plow into it. And, and uh, somebody has to come and pick up the dead bodies and try to give a little mouth-to-mouth resuscitation and breathe a little of, of the spirit of life back into the corpses before uh, before rigor mortis sets in. Well, it's good to be here this morning. I didn't mean to wax all that eloquent. Uh, I'll probably uh, reveal to you that I'm a ninth grade dropout after a while. But if I preached in ecclesiastical phraseology this morning, you'd probably go to sleep like you used to in that other church. So uh, I'll stay in street language. Uh, you preaching to black folks, you gotta, you got to make it plain. And uh, I, I just got used to that. And uh, praise God, uh, they accuse me of being black. Uh, they do. I bought my Cadillac, and uh, four big strong men walked up to me and said, Well, said, we're going to accept you now. Said, uh, every black preacher ought to have a Cadillac. So I've been accepted, and that's good to know. Hallelujah. I'm probably going to use this this morning, sound man. Give me a little more power. I, at home, and I won't dare say this here, but at home I often say, I wonder if sound men can be saved. But I, I won't say that here this morning, because when you get that sound man angry, he can do things to you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Might be better if I turned it on. Hallelujah. Uh, Now, uh, I'm going to continue this morning. It's good to have some folks from Church Point, Louisiana with us. Wave your hand, brother and sister John Fala and sister Ruby. Wave your hand. I used to pastor these poor folks over there in Church Point. And uh, after I left, what, 18 years ago, they, they've got a little bit of life back into them since I left. I left them devastated, but uh, they've been revived a little bit, and they came over uh, this morning, uh, maybe, I don't know what for, <laughs> uh, praise God. But it's good to have them with us this morning. Brother John Fala is an Italian married to a Boudreaux. And everybody knows what Boudreaux is. Uh, hallelujah. Oh, there's wonderful folks down on the bio. They're, they're wonderful folks. Uh, they make that crawfish etouffee and that catfish cubion like nobody else in the world. And I'll never forget Sister Boudreaux's stuffed pork chops. I still dream about them, Brother Kenneth. I still dream about them stuffed pork chops. Lord have mercy. Well, hadn't been back 17 years, 18 years, I forget. 
Now this morning, let's. I've got to. I've got to hurry on because I've got a lot, and uh, uh, I, I, I don't know where we're going to go, and I don't know where we're going to wind up. But that apostolic church. I, I don't want to read my text again. Uh, they went everywhere preaching the word of God. They came staggering out of that upper room of talking in tongues, yeah. drunk in the spirit. They didn't care who was there and who wasn't. Uh, and uh, Peter, uh, who had tucked his head in front of a little girl, denied the Lord three times. When he came out of that upper room, he was a powerful apostolic preacher. Stood up and poked his bony finger in their face, said, You with wicked hands have crucified the Lord of glory. He was not a love preacher. And he laid it on them so hard they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the Lord added to the church uh, 3,000 souls that day. And uh, we, we turn over a page in John, uh, Peter and John going up uh, to the temple to pray, he reached down his hand. And I, I don't want to dwell on that too much. Uh, but uh, he went leaping and shouting into the house of God, uh, rejoicing and and, and praising God that he had been healed. And then uh, uh, just a, a, a few verses of Scripture, uh, 4,000 were added to the church. And then uh, it just said multitudes uh, were added to the church. Then uh, uh, they just emptied the hospital and brought them out there. And, and the shadow of Peter passing by uh, fell on them and they were healed. Every one of them were healed. Praise God. They just emptied the hospital and brought them out there, and, and every one of them got healed. And, and then we read in, in, in Revelation where uh, that Laodicea church, uh, uh, rich and uh, affluent, uh, uh, didn't know God, had him locked outside, and he was knocking on the door trying to get in. And uh, somewhere, somewhere between apostolic power and Laodicea, that's where we are this morning. That's where I am. I, I, I don't think any of us are bold enough to stand up and say that, well, we have that apostolic power. Uh, and we, we don't have apostolic uh, love, and we don't have the signs and the wonders following. I, I don't know of anybody that brings everything they own to church and lay it down at the preacher's feet. We, we don't have that apostolic love in our midst, and uh, we might get on that a little bit. There's been so much of that pseudo-love preached uh, around the country in different places until uh, we might get into that apostolic love. Jesus said, and, and sometimes I quote this to my wife, Brother Travis, uh, sometimes she gets bold enough to tell me, she'll say, I love you. And I, I'll quote John fourteen fifteen. If you love me, keep my commandments. Praise God. Now you you got to be bold to say that to your wife, because uh, that might uh, that might change uh, the biscuit supply early in the morning. You might be eating dry toast uh, instead of those biscuits. But if you love me, Jesus said, uh, keep my commandments. And this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Praise God. We don't have apostolic love. Now, in your mind this morning, and in a lot of people's mind, and it was probably, it was in my mind, that that powerful apostolic church back there in Acts chapter 2, that was a different dispensation of time. And if we're not careful, we're going to wind up being about half Church of Christ. Don't worry about them, Brother Killingsworth. I probably won't look at them anyhow. Uh, we're, we're about half Church of Christ if we don't watch out. You know, that's what the Church of Christ say. The signs and wonders are all over, and, and the Baptists say you don't have to talk in tongues anymore. And if we're not careful, we're going to wind up about half Church of Christ. And I want to impress on your mind that there's only been one church. There is only one church. Praise God. Now I'm going to put out my finger on the root of our problem. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and 12, Brother Killingsworth, and read for me. Uh, use your most melodious voice, Brother Killingsworth. 
Uh, 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 2 Corinthians 10. I'm, I'm going to put my finger on the root of our problem this morning. And I'll probably use this scripture a little later on in the week when we get to talking about uh, holiness. We don't have apostolic holiness either. Praise God. No, we don't have it. Read Brother Killen's word. 10 and 12. 10 and 12. For we dare not make ourselves... Now, we dare not, but we've already done it. We dare not make ourselves... Of the number. Of the number. Or compare ourselves... Or compare ourselves... With some that can commend themselves... With some that commend themselves. And we've got plenty of those folks around... Yeah. Bragging about how many prayed through on Sunday night and how many they baptized and how many they laid hands on and, and, and they received the Holy Ghost and uh, I laid my hands on this and I prayed. And, and we, we got a lot of that going around that commend themselves. Yes. But that is the spirit of Simon the sorcerer that is in our ranks. All right. And I might add, we don't have apostolic discernment either. Peter said, Ananias, why did Satan fill thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? All right. Come on. If we had apostolic discernment, why is it that homosexuals and adulterers walk around in our ranks? All right. Come on. Right. We don't have apostolic discernment either. And if we did have an ounce of apostolic discernment, we don't have apostolic boldness enough to stand up and say, Hey! All right. Praise God! I'm preaching to you. Sure. But while I point my finger, that thumb's pointing back at me now. Praise God! Those that commend themselves. Now, they, uh, Simon the sorcerer was going around... And he had convinced everybody that he was the great power of God. We've had some come through our ranks that had everybody convinced that they were the great power of God. That revival was, uh, was uh, it was inherent and it dwelt only in their grasp and in their ability. And if you don't do it like I do it, you'll never have revival. My God, my God. You're preaching, Westerberg. I know I'm preaching. That's right. You're I know what I'm preaching. Yeah. I'm living dangerously right now. Uh, don't worry me. <laughs> Praise God. Brother Travis, I've had tapes mailed to headquarters. And brother, sitting in Brother Urshan's office, he laughs. Yeah, brother Urshan and I have a good relationship. I thought when he wheeled that tape out, I said, oh my, I'm going to catch it now. And he laughed. I had said on this tape that W.T. Witherspoon was no doubt a sweet Christian gentleman. But in 1945, we made a mistake. And Brother Urshan said, Brother Westberg, he said, I want to tell you. He said, W.T. Witherspoon was no sweet Christian gentleman. He said he was strong as acid and hard as a rock and gun barrel straight. And he laughed. And that's all I heard about my tape. Praise God. I'm glad you told me, Brother Travis, that this pulpit is free. Right. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now those that commend themselves. See, I come back and I picked it up. Didn't I? Yeah. Sure. We've got those in our ranks that commend themselves. Right. We ought to be glorifying God and lifting Him up. He yeah. said, if I be lifted up, yeah. I'll draw all men to me. I'm watching that fellow that's commanding himself. I don't have apostolic power. I don't have probably any more of it than you do and probably not as much as a lot of you. But at least I come to the realization that I don't have it and I want it this morning. And I'm reaching for it. Yes, Praise God. Those that commend themselves, read Brother But Gilles. they measure themselves they by themselves. They measure themselves by... Now, here's where we're at this morning. We measure ourselves by ourselves. All right. Read on. And comparing themselves among themselves. And we compare ourselves among ourselves. Are not wise. We're not wise. No, we're not spiritual and we're not apostolic. Come on. We say, well, the church down the road, the church across 
town. They're all doing it. And I don't know how you preach, and I really don't care. I told my church, I said, don't come in here with them slit skirts. That's a dead giveaway. If a skirt is so tight that you've got to slit it to walk, it's too tight. Right? My God, i got to train you this morning. When I say right at home, they say right. And then they say the man is right. Dead right. Praise God. I, I said, you say what's wrong with a little slit about that much? I said, a little slit that much is just that much too much. Praise God. And I won't be fooled with it. Praise God. Now I get up in my pulpit. But they measure them. Wait a minute now. now. I got a lot of black folks. And I say, God is colorblind till you get ready to get married. And I won't be messed with. Praise God. I'm too old to run scared. And I'm going to tell you something spiritual. Black folks don't want intermarriage any more than white folks. My God have mercy. Oh, you looking at me now. I can't stand somebody that runs scared. Afraid to say it. Now, you may not like me, but I'm going to say it. Praise God. One man told me, he said, I don't like that. I said, I don't remember asking you what you liked. <laughs> All right. I don't remember asking you. Woo! My God. Somebody said, get t- <laughs> I'm trying to be sweet, and here I go again. I, 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 I vow, Brother Travis, I'm going to be sweet this morning. And then that spirit comes on me again, and, and here I go, and I'm trying to trying to preach sweet. Yeah. Now we measure ourselves by ourselves. The church down the street and the one across town, they're doing this, so that makes it all right. All right. Because the church across town. We're measuring ourselves by ourselves. And we ought to be looking at that apostolic sister that's in the ground. Give me First Thessalonians 4.14, Brother Killen's word. You listen to me this morning. God has already got a one God holy church in the ground. He's already got a one God blood washed church in the ground. He's already got a bride in the ground. And we're sitting back saying, Bless God, we're the little one God apostolic Jesus name, and we better be. And we preached water baptism in Jesus' name and repentance and the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And we got to have it. There's no other way. Galatians 1 and 8 said, If I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. If a man is preaching anything else, let him go to hell. That word accursed... In the Greek means a gift that has been offered and rejected and consigned to eternal judgment. If I don't mean go to hell, it just, you don't have any meaning at all. But that powerful sister of ours that's in the ground, 
I preached a sermon one time on identical twins. Our sister stood in the dust of the Roman Colosseum and listened to the roar of the lions behind the gates. Listen to the screams of a bloodthirsty crowd and spill their blood in the dust of a Roman Colosseum because they would not deny Christ. I'm preaching about a sister that's in the ground. If there's only one church, we ought to be an exact replica of our sister. We ought to be an identical twin to our sister that's in the ground. Read for the killings were. Or if we believe, now if you believe, that Jesus died and rose again, Jesus died and rose again, even so them also, them also, which sleep in Jesus, which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with will him. Will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, for this we say unto you, by the word, of the, the word Lord, of the Lord, that we which are alive, we which are alive, and hold remain, on right there, we alive and remain. You know, we, uh, I, I used to go through that real quick. We that are alive and remain, you know, we're, we're breathing, our, our lungs are working, we're, we're pulling in that oxygen, the blood's flowing in our veins, we're, uh, we've got a pulse, you know, we're, we're alive. But the Greek word does not mean that. Now, we came alive in here last night. Peter said, lively stones. That word alive in the Greek means a strong, vibrant, apostolic church full of power. Come on. God is coming back for a church that is alive. With the power of God in its midst. Yes, sir, and remain. With the signs and the wonders following. Hallelujah. Yeah. He's coming back not for Laodicea, but He's coming back for a church that is alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We which are alive, we're alive. Praise God. Yes. All right. Praise God. Alive. He's coming back for an apostolic church. Alive and remain. Now I got to I got to run in a word study on that word remain. That word means like a city that has been through a storm and came through unscathed and undamaged and untouched. That word remain, it's, it means like a soldier that has come through a terrible battle without a wound or a scar on him. This church that God comes back over for is going to be a church that has been through the battle, but came through it unscarred and untouched. A church that has been through a storm, but did not let the storm have any effect upon it. The winds of false doctrine are blowing in our ranks. But the apostolic church is coming through untouched. God is not coming back. Ephesians 5 and 27, Brother Killen's word. God is not coming back for a carnal, worldly, charismatic church. We need to get it in our mind there's only one church and we've got to be like that church. It is imperative 
that we be like that church. We have got to be like that church. Or else when our sister comes out of the ground, she will not recognize us. She'll say, who is that? Read Brother Killen's word. That we might, or that he might present it to himself. He might present it to himself. A glorious church. We've got to be a glorious church. My God, we're measuring ourselves by the Baptist. We measure ourselves by the Presbyterian. We say, well, bless God, we're the little one God apostolic tongue talking holy rollers. But we're not apostolic. We measure ourselves by that carnal, cold television watching church. Say, huh? We're so much more spiritual than they are. Praise God. When I came out of this 34 years ago, I'd been a, I told you yesterday, I'd been a cowboy and a sailor and a truck driver. And I came off from a foreign contract. I worked a year and a half in Francais, Morocco, French Morocco, to some of you. I worked a year and a half in French Morocco for a construction company. And that was like... That was like the foreign legion or legion. Every man had a prison record. He was running from something is the reason he was over there. The scum of society, the outcast, the gutter. And I was there a year and a half. And that's where God brought me to my knees. Hey, this generation thinks they found something with this pot. Thirty-five years ago, I sat cross-legged on the floor with a bunch of rag-headed Arabs, drank their mint tea and smoked their hashish. Thirty-five years ago. And when I got a hold of this, and when God delivered me from my sin... Praise the Lord. It's been alive in me ever since. I want to go all the way. When I was in the world, I pulled the throttle back. I want to live for God just like that. Last, oh, I, I better not get on that too much. Read on, Brother Killingsworth. Let's see what God's coming back after. That He might present it to A him glorious church, church. That He might present it. Not having spot. Not having a spot. Or a wrinkle. Or a wrinkle. Or any such thing. Or any such thing. I'm going to preach on any such thing someday. A spot or a wrinkle or any such thing. Read on. But that it should be holy. Holy! My God, are we holy. Read on. And without blemish. Without blemish! Read. So men ought to love their wives. Ah, You ought to love your wife. I'm going to touch on that and I'm going to get off and get back. You know... We're quick to jump out there and throw our chest out and say, Woman, submit yourself. But everywhere it said, Wives, submit yourself. It said, Husband, love your wife. You know, it'd be plumb easy to love a woman that's under submission. I could just... Well, I want to say I do... But probably she won't agree with that. Uh, just shower her with attention and adoration and compliments. And, but then, 
if a man just showered her with adoration and compliments, it would be easy to submit yourself to a man like that. Ooh. Oh, you're preaching again, Westberg. I know I'm preaching. Instead of growling like a bear, come in and start patting her on the cheek. Oh, there might be all kinds of apple pie. Mm-hmm. I better get back. I'm meddling now. I'm meddling now. Praise God. Well, he's coming back for an apostolic church. We might as well get it in our mind that he's coming back for an apostolic church. That's what I've been trying to tell you. Now, I'm, I'm going back to the apostolic church, and I'm going to draw their picture a little bit. Acts 4 and 13, by the Kellen's word, they knew God. The apostolic church knew God. They knew Him. Paul said in Philippians, Oh, that I might know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. They knew Him. Praise God. He had called them from uh, the, the, the fisherman's net and from the, the tax table. And he had called them and they had walked with Him and they knew Him. And you're going to have to know Him to be in that apostolic church. First off, you're going to have to know who He is. Except you believe that I am, you're going to die in your sin. You've got to know that He was the mighty God, uh, robed in flesh. God manifest in the flesh. Jesus said, except you believe, in St. John 8 and 24, except you believe that I am He, and that word He is inserted uh, by the translator, it should read, except you believe that I am, you're going to die in your sins. The Trinitarians are going to hell. Jimmy Swaggart would have gone to hell if he'd have never fooled with that prostitute. That's right. All right. That's right. Except you believe that I am. That's the I am that spoke to Moses. That's the I am that was before Abraham. Except you believe that I am. You're going to die in your filthy sin. You better know and believe that He is God manifest in the flesh. Uh, God, it's a temptation to preach things to make them shout. <laughs> oh, I know how to do it. I know what tickles your little gizzard. Get you up off your seat. I know that I'm not, I'm not here for that. Uh, God, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, I got to preaching this at home. And uh, I'm still not through with it. I'm going home and, and, and continue on. And, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more to go. But they knew Him. Read by the killing's word. Acts 4.13. Now when they saw the boldness... Now when the Sanhedrin court saw the boldness... Of Peter and John... Of Peter and John... And perceived... And they perceived... That they were unlearned... That they were unlearned... And ignorant men... And ignorant men... They marveled... They marveled... They took knowledge... They had to acknowledge... Of them... That they had been with... They Jesus. had been with... Jesus... Been with Jesus... They knew Him... Yeah. Been with Jesus... They knew Him... Oh yeah... Oh... Now I'm, I'm where I wanted to go... Second Timothy 3 and 7... Brother Killingsworth, they knew him. You say, well, Brother Westberg, I know him. Well, I, I, I'm not so sure that I even know him. And here I am trying to tell you how to know him. But I, I have learned some things down through the years, through adversity. And as ignorant and clumsy and uncouth and unlearned and unknowledgeable as I am, 
Some things have become so glaringly apparent to me to know Him. I'm going to tell you like, I'm going to tell you how, 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 how we really are this morning. Read Brother Killen's word. Ever learning. Ever learning. And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. When I went to school in a one-room country schoolhouse with 30 students and a man teacher with a bundle of hickory switches in the corner, and I'm the only one of my six brothers and sisters that got whooped to school, and I got whooped repeatedly. And Mom never did ask what happened, or <laughs> I just got another one when I got home. She never said what for, or did the teacher, she never said anything. They'd run in and say, he got a whooping, and she, here it come. I remember out running a whole bunch and got in there first, and my mama was sitting at that old sewing machine with that foot treadle. She was sewing overall mittens for us to put on her hands because we was poor folks, and I don't want to tell you how poor you'd stop and take an offering for me right now if I told you how poor I grew up. But she's sitting there sewing mittens, and I, I ran in and said, Mom, hurry up and whoop me before they get here. I don't want them to watch it. And, and sure enough, she whooped me before they got there. She did. My mama never feared man or beast. The Greyhound bus driver made her move four seats back on the bus. Because she told him you're going to hell smoking them cigarettes. She feared neither man nor beast. But she did fear God. Now, we're like some of them folks. Now, I, I, I was smart and an A student clear up till I dropped out. But I didn't have sense enough to keep going. But there were some that they just wouldn't try to learn. Maybe some of them couldn't. And the teacher every year would pass them on, Brother Travis. Yeah. She'd get tired of fooling with them, shooting them paper wads, pulling the girls' pigtails, cutting up. And she'd just pass them on to the next grade to get rid of them. That's after I got out of that one-room schoolhouse and that one teacher. And they get to the next grade, and that next teacher gets tired of fooling with them. Didn't learn a thing. Never passed the grade yet. Never passed the test. Just keep rolling them on. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Sometimes I wonder if that's not the way it is with us and God. We're never able to grasp it somehow. And yet it's so plain so plain. God just passed. But what about graduation day? And I'm afraid there's a graduation day coming. And we don't really know God like we need to know God. I, I got into this one time and I, 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 I had part of this on the in a board one time, but Travis, I hope hope you won't find it repetitious. And I'm going to repeat some things. I uh, I didn't realize that God can be moved. Didn't realize that. And you have to be careful when you start talking like this, because if God don't want to be moved, you're not going to move Him. God is sovereign and answers to no one. But God is bound to His Word. The Holy One of Israel cannot lie. God is chained to His Word. I learned that one day. And it was so profound 
For a long time, I didn't realize what I had done. I came back from Morocco, high rolling, went to Houston, got in church, prayed through, and for one solid year, a little over, I looked for a job. I walked the streets of Houston, Texas, looking for a job. And the devil began to talk to me, said, well, when you was out there in the world high rolling and living in the fast lane, you always had a good job and plenty of money. Now here you come to God, you had $7,000 in your pocket when you hit the city. That's a lot of money in 1953, 7200 and some dollars in the Industrial State Bank at the corner of Harrisburg and Old Spanish Trail in Houston, Texas. I had it. And I remember growing up a poor boy. Never had a new car in my life, and I took that old ragged 48 Pontiac eight miles south of Houston to Stafford. I was still a sinner now. And I traded it in on a brand new 1953 Chieftain Deluxe Straight 8 Hydromatic Pontiac with everything on it that a man could get on it. And the man said, how do you want them payments? And I lit a Roy Tan cigar and took a deep breath and blew smoke in his face. And I said, I'll just write you a check. <laughs> and I still got to cancel check. Yeah. But then I prayed through. And I walked in the streets and the devil talking to me. Uh -huh. All right. And one night in an apartment over on Chocolate Bio Road, I was living with my little brother. I, I, I had met my sweet wife. She hadn't trapped me yet. I mean, she hadn't... I, I hadn't, I hadn't, well, I hadn't proposed yet, yet. And I, I, I was laying there in the middle of the night in, in debt to my older brother. My money was gone, and I was rolling and tossing two o'clock in the morning, and I, I slipped out of bed and shut the door so I wouldn't wake my little brother, and I got out there in, in the living room, and I spread my Bible out on the couch, and I got down, and oh, I was travailing in my spirit. Let me tell you something. A lot of the time, a lot of the reasons we can't touch God, a lot of time we don't get desperate enough. We're too comfortable. We, it, it took God a year to bring me to that place where I would get desperate before God. But now I was desperate. And I opened my Bible to St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 15. Whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do it. And I put my finger on that Scripture, and I raised my eyes toward heaven, and I said, God, you know I'm a living for you. There's not sin in my life anywhere. I'm doing everything I can to live for you. It said in your word that anything I ask in your name, you would do it. I'm going to believe you. I want a job. You know it's right for a man to work and pay his bills. I want a job. All right. And a sweet peace come over me. And I got up and turned the light out and closed my Bible and went to bed and slept like a baby. Four days later, Houston Belt and Terminal Railway called me and I was working on a job in four days. Now you are looking at me now. Job chapter 2 and verse 3, Brother Killingsworth. I wish I had two or three readers. Move, God. You need to understand some things about God. When, when water reaches 212 degrees on the thermometer, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, it will boil at sea level. There is not a force in heaven or hell but God that can stop it from boiling. And it's one of the laws of God, and God has not changed His law. I don't care when water reaches 212 degrees, it's going to boil. But it will not boil at 211 degrees. It will not boil at 200 degrees. 
will not. And God, now you listen to me now, when the sins of Noah's day reached a certain place, Genesis 6 and 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. The sins of Noah's generation had reached a place where it attracted the attention of God. And God, in order to maintain His credibility in the celestial, have ever created man, and I'm going to destroy him from the face of the earth. It reached that place where it moved God. When the last load of mortar and the last brick was placed in place, in the Tower of Babel, in the 11th chapter of Genesis. God said, I'm going down now and see what these men are doing. Because the Tower of Babel had reached the place where God was going to deal with it. In Genesis 18 and 20, Brother Killingsworth, Genesis 18 and 20. Listen to this one. Listen to it. What time is it? Well, oh, i got a little time. And the Lord said... And the Lord said... Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah... Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah... Is great... It's great. And because their sin is very grievous. Their sin is very grievous. I will go down now. I will go down now. And see whether they have done all together. And see if they have done all together. According to the cry of it. According to the cry of it. Which has come up unto me. Which has come up unto me. If not, I will know. Now, when the sins of Sodom, I don't know how long Sodom had been sinning. I don't know how long. Give me a little more on the monitor, please, sound man. I don't know how long they had been involved in their filthy sexual perversion. And I'm going to digress a little here. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, in the days of Lot, you see the sexual perversion, the almost fervid involvement in sports. But in Ezekiel, hold that place and go to Ezekiel 16.49, Brother Killingsworth. As it was in the days of Sodom, so, it's going to be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus said in Luke 18 and 8, Will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when He comes? I'm going to get in on that later on. Read Brother Killen's word. Behold! Now this is God talking about Sodom. Behold! This was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. This was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. He did not mention the perverse sexual sins. But listen to what God said the sin of Sodom was. Pride. Pride. Oh, hey, we've got it, Brother Travis. Yeah. In the UPC. Come on. <coughs> i got a heart chef and Mark's suit. No. Mine's a Kuppenheimer. Bought it at an outlet in Little Rock. Cheap, cheapy, cheapy, cheap. You suppose I've seen him with a head high? 
I've got a heart shifter in marks. I'm riding. You suppose God's going to, the great white throne, going to say, because you're wearing a heart shifter in marks, come on in, you know? Pride! Fullness of bread. Oh, wait a minute now. Pride and fullness. Oh, you've been treating me so nice since I've been here. Brother Travis, do you need an administrative assistant of some kind? I believe I'll stay in Mississippi. You, you're so good to me. Maybe you need a chauffeur? I, I can drive. Believe me, I can drive. Now, my wife don't think so. She has to instruct me all the time. I taught, I taught her to drive. My little girl and her... Both of I don't, I, I don't guess if that company I worked for 17 years had have known what a help they would have been to me. She, they would have hired my wife to go with me and instruct me. Now, I, I, I'm meddling now. I, I got to get back. I got to get back. Fullness of bread. Bread and fullness of bread. Hey, we're full. Fullness of bread. Pride and fullness of bread was the and a, sin of Sodom. Now, God said that. An abundance of idleness. An abundance of idleness. Three day weekends and three week vacations. Abundance of idleness and fullness of bread. Was in her. That's what led to the sexual perversion. My God, when Moses went up on the mountain, when leadership was gone, they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Yeah. When leadership... You better thank God for your leadership in the Mississippi district. Honey, I better get, I might get on that. When leadership is gone. When leadership was gone, they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And my God, i got to get back. To knowing God. Come on. Moving God. Give me Job 2 and 3, Brother Killingsworth. You, God can be moved. Listen to this. This the, is God talking to the devil. And the Lord said unto Satan, Lord said to the devil, Has thou considered my servant Job? You considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth? There is none like him in the earth. A perfect. He is a perfect and an upright man. And an upright man. One that fears God. One that fears God and is true of evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity. He holdeth fast his integrity, though thou movest me you against him. Moved me against him, to Satan. Destroyed him without cause. It was not the intention of God to do that to Job. No. But Satan moved God yeah. to do it. Do Give me Deuteronomy 32.21, Brother Killen's word. God can be moved when the atmosphere reaches a certain place. When certain conditions exist, God can be moved. There are things that move God. When my wife pats me on the cheek, it moves me. And when she points out my weaknesses, that moves me too. In a different direction. <laughs> Praise God. Read Brother Killen's word. And it shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. When many evils... Read. And troubles are befallen them. When troubles are befallen them. That this song shall testify against them. My God, did I give you the right one? 32. 32. 21. Okay, I'm wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. They have moved me to jealousy. Israel's idol worshiping had moved God to jealousy. 
Now, he loved them so much, he sent a deliverer down into Egypt and divided the Red Sea and brought them out. But their idol worship moved him to jealousy. With that which is not God moved him to jealousy. Acts chapter 12 and verse 5. Moving God. Now, I, 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 I preached this in the negative this morning. When the sins of Sodom reached a certain place, when the rebellion and the sin of Babel, when the cry of Sodom reached a certain place, <laughs> it moved God. It moved God. But now, in Acts chapter 10, the angel said, Cornelius, thy prayers have, thy prayers and thy alms have come up as a memorial before God. The prayers and the alms of Cornelius had reached a certain place. That it moved God. And God sent an angel down to Cornelius, said, Send up to the house in Joppa and get Simon Peter. God was moved by that memorial of prayer and almsgiving that come up before Cornelius had built before God. A lot of times. Our prayers are unanswered because we have not built a memorial up before God. We say, God, give me... We, we pray those Santa Claus prayers. we got a give me list, a Christmas list, that long. And we, uh, we, we get up on God's lap like a little kid getting on Santa Claus now saying, I want this and I want that and I want this and I want that. And then, and then all our prayer life amounts to is, God bless this hamburger and now I lay me down to sleep. The reason sometimes we can't find God, we're wandering in a, we're lost in a forest of carnality. We can't find our way because we're lost in a forest of carnality. And I've only been lost once in my life squirrel hunting in East Texas in the Piney Woods got lost one time. It's a terrible feeling. Carnal. Walking through the dry desert of a prayerless life. Dying of thirst by the river of life. Standing on the bank of the river of life. Dying of thirst. Starving to death in the house of bread. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Read Brother Killingsworth. Peter therefore was kept in prison. Peter was in jail. Now, Herod had took James and beheaded him. And I wonder... If the church had moved God for James, if James would not have got beheaded. Sometimes, you know, when they were in trouble out there on the sea, and they were struggling in the, in the storm, and Jesus came walking to them on the water, and the Bible said He would have passed them by. He saw that He, was, he, he intended to walk right on by. But they cried out. Yes. And when they cried out, it moved him. Yeah. It changed his direction. Yeah. Because they had moved God. And the apostolic church could move God. Yes. Yeah. Peter was in prison. 
But prayer was made. But prayer was made without ceasing. Without ceasing of the church unto God for Him. Oh, in that prayer, I'm inclined to believe that if they hadn't have prayed, God would have let Peter's head roll. But they begin to pray without yeah. ceasing. Without ceasing. And it moved God. Yeah. God said, "Get down there, angel." Angel walked in and said, Get up, Peter. Peter stood up and the chains fell off. Yep. They started walking yep. toward the door. Yes. Gates and doors began to fly open. Yes. Hallelujah. Because their prayer moved down. Yeah. That apostolic church could move down. Praise God. Right. I got one more. Isaiah 38 and 1. For the killing's worth. Read for me. In those days, those days, when Hezekiah was sick unto death, Hezekiah was sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah the prophet, came unto him, came unto him, said unto him, said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Thus saith the Lord, Set the house in order. You better set your house in order. And I shall die. You're going to die. God live. And not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to unto the Lord. You listen to this. And said, and said, remember now, remember now, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, I beseech thee, I have walked before thee, I have walked before in thee, in truth, in truth, and with a perfect heart, and with a perfect heart, and have done that, and I have done that, which is good in which thy is sight, good in thy sight, and Hezekiah wept sore, and Hezekiah wept sore, then the word of the Lord, and it moved down. And it moved God. God said, Isaiah, turn around. I've heard thy prayer. I've heard his prayer. I've seen thy tears. I've seen your tears. I will add unto thy days fifteen I'm going to years. Give you fifteen more years. Yeah. Hezekiah moved God. Oh, hallelujah. Glory. He moved God. Yes. Hallelujah. The apostolic church knew him. Yeah, knew him. Yeah. Oh. Hezekiah said, I have walked before you in truth. There's no iniquity in my heart. I've done everything you asked me to do. John said, Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Paul said, I have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. If we're walking right and we can pray right, we can move God. I moved God that night on Chocolate Mile Road 30 some years ago. I didn't know what I was doing. I was desperate. I had to have something. And I moved God. The prayer. God is bound to His Word. It's the will of God your neighbors be saved. It's the will of God your city. I tell the devil that city belongs to me. Uh, I'm praying I'm going to make an apostolic city USA. It's going to be the first apostolic city. Uh, I may never get it, but I'm reaching for it. I may never have apostolic power, but I'm reaching for it. I believe that I could handle it if I had the power. Brother Travis, I've wondered, Westberg, maybe the reason God don't heal folks every time you lay your hands on them is because you might get full of pride and you might get lifted up and you might get the ego tripping. And you might get all lifted up in your spirit and be lost. But I believe, I believe I could handle that. We've had some miraculous healings. I got called out to Irwin Army Hospital. A little old five, six-year-old child laying there in the bed, just bones and skin. Prayed for him. Three days later, he's out of the hospital. 
That boy was in a coma, dying of cancer. Now his folks won't admit that God healed him because they're Baptist. Brother Kenneth, do you remember when we went? What was that woman's name? I forgot. Gwen, when? Came back from Louisiana camp. If I don't tell it right, correct me. She was Catholic. Brother Kenneth, 99 and 9 tenths percent of Church Point, Louisiana is Catholic. We come back from Louisiana camp. Brother Kenneth met her down, met her husband down at the soft cream and and asked, and she, she was dying. She was in a coma, and all the relatives were gathered in, and, and it, it was bad. And he said, Brother Kenneth said, Would you mind if my pastor come by and prayed? And he said, No, I wouldn't mind. And we walked up under that carport. You remember that, Brother Kenneth? Boy, that old Catholic spirit hit us like a wall. Bam! She'd been in a coma for something like eight hours, dying on a hospital bed in the kitchen. The women were inside. The men were out under the carport. I could feel the pressure, Brother Travis. We walked in. There she lay. She's skin and bones. We prayed. Seemed like nothing happened. I tried to talk to them a little bit and get their get that resentment out. Trying to reach through that resentment. You could feel it laying in there, deep. Shortly after we locked out, she sat up in bed. Said, give me a drink of water. She would call me every morning to come by and pray. Every morning my phone rang. Come by and pray for me, preacher. The wife and I would go by and pray. She got stronger. She got out of bed. She began to walk. She began to eat. She began to gain strength. The wife said to me, she said, I believe it's time we preach the gospel to her. So, we that morning we began to talk to her about salvation. And she stopped us. She said, look, I was born a Catholic. That was true. She said, I'm going to die a Catholic, and that was true. She said, and I can't wait till I get well enough to go dancing. The burden lifted, and I never went back. She never called me again. Three, four months later, she died of cancer. I believe if God would give us that apostolic power, I believe it's going to come through the signs and the wonders. When we can begin, the apostolic power begins to move in us. And we can get to the place where we can move God. And the signs and wonders begin to happen in the church. Then I believe our apostolic revival is going to come. But we're going to have to get to the place where we can move God. In Mark it said they went everywhere. God working with them. Oh, if God would work with me. Oh, if I could find that secret place in God where there was a free flow of the Spirit of God all the time. I try to stay in an attitude of prayer. I've gone to sleep praying and woke up in the middle of the night praying and went back to sleep praying.
praise God. And I've got to quit. It's time for me to quit. I want so desperately to know God. I want to know Him. I want to be able to move God. I want God to work with me with apostolic power. But it's not going to come by accident. It's not going to come. It's not going to come by accident. God bless you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's stand and lift our hands. Could we do that? And praise our good Lord. Amen.